this is Current Yield, Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air. I am Jim Grant, and with me, as always, is uh, the great Deputy Editor of Grant's, Evan Lorenz. And we have a new sound technician today, and his name is Harrison Waddell, who does everything else in this office except conduct sound engineering. So this is an adventure for you listeners and for us speakers. <laughs> but thank you, Harrison. And, uh, and we have a guest, as we are wont to do. And our guest name is David Samra. And he is one heck of an investor. He's a managing director at Artisan Partners and a founding partner of the International Value Team. And uh, a great favorite of of Evans is the entire artisan partner enterprise, right? I've been impressed by their uh, anal- analytic team. Yeah, and by their results. So we'll get around to Dave in one moment. Hey, Evan, I, I have um, noted a couple of things in the past two days. One, I've noted the New York Times is putting or thinking about putting its podcast behind a paywall. It's good news, right? Yeah, so you're saying we're going to be safe? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are not going to do that um, as of now because we, we don't care about money that much, do we? I mean, a little, but... It's nice to have a little spending money occasionally. But, uh, oh, if, if money is on the agenda, as it sometimes, um, indeed, almost always is at Grants, we ought to uh, remind our listeners about the upcoming Fall Grants Conference, the 2024 conference. I guess this is our uh, 40th, right? 40th Annual Grants Conference. It's Tuesday, October 1st at the Plaza Hotel. And uh, I know, speakers include Boaz Weinstein and uh, Sean Filer and uh, Bob Robotti and Michael Green and Stan Druckenmiller and William A. Ackman. I, I've, I've got uh, Bill Ackman's title. Hmm. I think I might have mentioned this once or twice or a half dozen times around the office. The title is Harvard Corporation, Buy, Sell, or Hold. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, I'm a seller. I'm a seller at zero. <laughs> no, I speak, uh, ladies and gentlemen, not as a, uh, as a critic of Harvard, but as a proud alumnus of Indiana University. So I want to get that. So um, we are going to hear from David in, in just one moment. But in the meantime, Evan, I have, uh, I have a new gimmick. And the new gimmick is we are going to play a little bit of Jeopardy. And um, so uh, uh, I'll be uh, uh, Ken Jennings just for a few minutes, I- intermittently during this podcast. And uh, so... Uh, Let's see. The category is a world moguls for two hundred dollars, right? Okay. And um, the first clue is uh, kicked out of high school and was three times successfully, successively unsuccessful at getting into a crummy college. I think I need another clue for that one. Yeah. Well, they'll be coming up. And David, uh, you, you have to withhold because you're you're going to get this so soon. Uh, do I have to answer in the form of a question? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd know two hundred bucks. <laughs> So, uh, David, uh, tell us about this uh, about this thing about buying low and selling high. How do you do it? Uh, you do it very carefully. It's um, driven mainly through uh, having uh, some uh, well-researched conviction in a number. Uh, it's driven by spending an enormous amount of time studying businesses trying to estimate, you know, what the cash flows are coming out of that business uh, might look like in the future. And we, we try to narrow that down, you know, to a figure that has, you know, it, it's going to have some sort of volatility around it. But the more research that we do, we can, we can narrow that uncertainty. So already this is turning into a, a, a controversial proposition because I have read in places that uh, markets are so efficient that you add about nothing by the diligence of visiting companies, studying data, et cetera, et cetera. And what say you to that? The evidence for it, of course, is the uh, titanic success of index funds. Yeah, well, the process is iterative, right? And so part of it is 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 estimating this cash flow, but then the question is, what is that cash flow worth? Mm. And that's where, uh, you know, the magic of cumulative knowledge build and experience and having some sort of anchor comes in. And it was interesting uh, listening to some other value investors talk about the same thing, but when I first started in this business, people would say, oh, you know, the P-E ratio for this business should be X, Y, Z. And I would say, well, why? Why should the P-E ratio? Well, you know, historically it's traded like this or it's moved around like that. And fortunately for me, early on in my career, before I was an investor, 
uh, I had spent time as uh, many people know this, but as a certified financial planner. And whenever we were thinking about an individual's investments, we would take a look at the the expected return from those investments relative to the risk free rate. And, and that's where your anchor comes from. And as long as you have an understanding about what type of business this is, um, is it an above average business? Is it a below average business? Is it an average business? And what sort of return you expect out of that average the ri- business? The, you risk, can, the risk-free rate. The risk-free Does rate. Does that pertain to treasuries trading at 60 cents on the dollar? It pertains to... Um, you know, a, a get, it, to some extent, it's a guess, right? And so we'll look yeah. at the average over, you know, I used to do it over 20 years, and then it fell down to this ridiculous level yeah. over the last decade. And we look at it over 30 years. And, you know, it's because I really want to stick to that 6% number, which I view as reasonable. Yeah. And as a non-U.S. investor, it gets well, speaking you know, of, somewhat speaking, interesting. Yeah, speaking of 20 years or 22 years, 22 years, I think, is the uh, length of time that the Artisan International Value Fund has been in operation and uh, in, in support of the proposition that it actually does add something to the value of an investment uh, by knowing what it's about. Um, over the course of time, um, your fund, David, has uh, returned about 11.5% per annum uh, as opposed to the index competition uh, the abstract index competition, which is about seven and a half or less. So that's a pretty wide gap, and that seems to speak uh, to something special happening when you knock on the door of a company that doesn't happen to speak English. Mm-hmm. So what is, what is the most mystifying encounter you've had abroad with a company that was the most foreign and yet the most repaying? Well, um, there are a lot of mysteries outside the United States, uh, there are a lot of mysteries in stock markets in general, and a lot of it has to comes down to the way investors behave around companies. So, you know, you, for example, will show up in India and recognize the fact that the whole country needs to be painted. And then you'll look at the, you know, the companies that are selling paint and it's trading at 55 or 60 times earnings, which seems to over index on, you know, what could possibly happen with this yeah. business. The things that mystify us the most that are uh, most beneficial is when the opposite happens. When you come across a company, so in, for today it might be uh, Alibaba or Samsung Electronics or something like that, where you know the, the quality of the business is apparent and obvious and easy to see. And the valuation of the business is apparent and obvious and easy to see the size, the scale, the return on capital, the the capital allocation behavior of the management team uh, are all constructive. Yet, you know, the, the equity will persist at five times earnings, and that is the greatest mystery to us, but one that we love. So, value investing inside the United States has struggled for more than a decade. It's underperformed the market overall. You have not struggled for uh, more than two decades. What What is it about value investing outside of the United States that is a more attractive proposition? Is it the markets are less efficient? Is it uh, How are you able to just outperform so much? Well, uh, you know, uh, cut me off if my answer gets too long here. But um, you know, first of all, non-U.S. markets are less liquid. Second, most of the capital invested in most of the markets outside the United States comes from the United States. Third, countries outside the United States aren't as good as the United States right? They grow slower. The return on capital is lower. Um, Spreads, just trading spreads are wider in many of these markets. And so those markets that companies grow slower, we we don't have big, giant platform growth companies outside. You have a few of them, you know, TSMC might be one or LVMH or L'Oreal, but there are very few of them. And so the markets outside the United States lend themselves to value investing. And as a result, it's, it's one, hard to be a growth stock investor outside the United States. And two, uh, I, you know, I, for people like us, you, you find because of the complexity, uh, securities oftentimes will get mispriced. And if you are patient 
and you are have an ability to recognize the difference between a good business and a bad business and when a good business is mispriced, which is kind of our stock and trade, kind of the way that we approach value investing, it can be an environment that is that is very fruitful. Yeah. So Evan, um, our mystery mogul, um, graduated uh, as was his want as a young man, like three years late from college, right? And he applied for an entry-level job at KFC. And there were 24 <laughs> of them who applied. Guess who didn't get hired? Is it our mystery guy? That guy. Oh, who is our mystery guy? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the question. I think you have to give me... Okay, so... Um, David, do you have a guess? Uh, I don't have a guess. Although I did work at KFC. You, you, they hired you. They hired me. Yeah, okay. I was one of the 23. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I see, uh, reading your uh, very well-written yeah, and your letters, quote, you. letters to your, uh, to your investors, I see grounds for uh, dismissing you from the union of, uh, of professional fund managers. For example, you say that it's important to um, report our mistakes. Now, that is uh, a breach of the etiquette of your, of, your, uh, of your tribe. So what do you have to say for yourself? Well, I, you know, we, you try to learn from the, the dumb things that you do over the years. You know, the stock market uh, and the information flow that we get as, as money managers uh, can be very seductive in many different ways. And, uh, and, and by recognizing the things that you do in error, uh, hopefully those seductions the next time they show up uh, can be ignored, and you move you move on. Um, so we like to report those to our shareholders, especially during time periods when our investment performance looks good. So people remember, uh, hey, you know, there will be time periods when investment performance doesn't look so good because these guys, you know, they do occasionally make mistakes. But really, what we're trying to do is we're we're trying to learn from those. And that message, you know, not only goes out to my shareholders, uh, but that message also goes out, you know, uh, shaming the people, including myself and the analysts that were my partners in crime when we decided to select that security that, hey, not only am I stupid because I allowed this to happen, but, uh, you know, you, you've made a bunch of errors, too. And so hopefully everybody learns from those mistakes. Well, if they're still on the payroll, I guess they would. <laughs> <laughs> so, so something you said here in the uh, annual uh, report for 2023, I thought was, was uh, struck me as it's a very compellingly easy and uh, and uh, and helpfully simple way of of analyzing the environment in which we all do business or write about doing of business. So um, you say that you're talking about your your top holdings and um, uh, in aggregate the revenue and operating profit from these businesses in 2023 was looking at to come in at a little over 385 billion and 44 billion that's operating that's revenue and operating profit 385 billion for revenue and 44 billion for operating profit that's 2023 and compare that with the final figures for 2022 and um, both of them were significantly higher revenue was 415 and operating profit was 70 which was the great standout year for equity performance. So, and, and, and you go on to note this is not your preferred way of, uh, of having things play out, but w I guess you didn't send the money back, but, <laughs> but did it make you more cautious about 2024? It didn't. Uh, you know, we, we, and I think probably most, most people that observe those companies knew that was coming uh, by the time that we, we entered that year. Um, you know, you could... You, you could see the fact that the companies where the earnings went backwards uh, were suffering from, you know, some sort of headwind in their business. And, of course, those headwinds sent the share price down well ahead of, you know, the onset of that year, which is what creates the opportunity. Of course, one of the, the greatest competitive advantages that a value investor has is patience, whereas most of the stock market is so focused on the immediate well, outcome. patience is, is is something you earn uh, by the uh, the nature of the investors who invest with you. No, it, and and that's also a complicated 
topic, especially when you manage a mutual fund where people can come and go as they please. And um, are they are they coming or going today? Uh, they uh, some are coming and some are going, and so it's roughly steady. Uh, which again, uh, you know, we're we're closed to new investors and have been uh, closed for almost uh, more than half, almost sixty percent of the time period that since we've been launched. Um, and so we very carefully uh, try to, to craft our dialogue to our shareholders and let them know that, especially now, managing so much money, you have a billion dollars or a billion and a half dollars in a single security, you can't get out in a day. And, you know, your investors need to know that, you know, the duration over which you're making these investments needs to match the duration over which they're investing, because otherwise, you know, we have a mismatch and we have a liquidity issue. And so it's, 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 it's very, very complicated to find the right people, yeah. you know, who understand what you do. It helps when your performance is good. Uh, David, so the U.S. makes up 4% of the world's population, but American stocks account for 64% of the MSCI All Worlds uh, Index. And I see from your letters that you mostly invest in international stocks, but I see the odd U.S. stock in there too, like Arch Capital Group. Mm-hmm. I, I'd love if you wouldn't mind telling me, like, how do valuations in the U.S. look like to the rest of the world and the rest of the world to the U.S.? Well, just to clarify, uh, Arch Capital is domiciled in Bermuda. Um, and, you know, we've had explaining to do to people that Bermuda is not the United <laughs> States. It just happens to trade you know, in the It's United like Canada States. in that respect, right? Yes, that's right. It's like Canada. And it's also, you know, people confuse Alibaba, for example, because it mostly trades in its ADR and sometimes compliance will categorize it as an American company. Um, but... Um, we the valuations outside the United States have always been throughout my career more or less lower than in aggregate, right? The aggregates are an inaccurate way. If if all companies, let me use an extreme example. If all companies outside the United States were General Motors and all companies inside the United States were Google, would you ever expect them to trade at the same valuations? If they did, there's an a massive inefficiency in one place versus another. And that encapsulates, you know, the vast majority of the reasons why over time you will generally see valuations in the United States higher than what you will see outside the United States. The quality of the businesses are lower. The rate at which they grow is slower. Um, Socialist structures are stronger outside the United States than they are inside the United States. Countries are smaller. The U.S. have 320 million rich people uh, all speaking one language and have a robust legal system with, you know, a venture capital and a private equity community that's that's unrivaled anywhere else in the world. It was growing very nicely in China, but that was stopped, hopefully temporarily, uh, a few years ago. Um, Okay, Uh, Dave, this is your chance on Jeopardy at this question, the mystery mogul question. I'm going to give you not one, but two, but I might even get three. Okay, our mystery mogul. Uh, uh, applied to and was rejected from the Harvard Business School for 10 consecutive reporting opportunities. He is a member of the Chinese Communist Party, and he appeared to the wonderment of the world doing a Michael Jackson riff and looked so strange. And then he disappeared from sight in 2020 for like three or four fiscal quarters. And would he have happened to put $50 million into his own company very recently? Who is... That was Jack Ma. Ah. Who is Jack Ma? <laughs> I thought this contestant would never get the answer. <laughs> so tell us about Al- Alibaba, which is trading like five times earnings, right? It is. It is. And um, Alibaba is very simply a great business. It uh, is, of course, the leading e-commerce company in China, similar to Amazon, They uh, sell some products out of their own inventory, but Alibaba is different than Amazon in that it mostly operates as a marketplace for other retailers or what's commonly referred to as 3P. Um, And that makes it effectively a better business. You know, you don't have to hold inventory and that requires capital uh, and you're just collecting a fee. It's also uh, a business that's closer to Google than it is to Amazon because it basically operates as a search engine. It's a big advertising machine, effectively, that has, you know, some of the uh, uh, commerce-driven aspects and logistics associated with 
uh, a retailer. Um, it is a, uh, it's a big company. Um, it, it has a market cap of $180 billion, so it's not hiding anywhere. Um, it is a, an extremely well-capitalized company, uh, about half of the market cap they have, and it's extraordinary in, in cash and securities. So the enterprise value is $90 billion. Um, and the company generates, you know, uh, last year, a little over $15 billion of operating profit, which included an extremely profitable core business. And then they have some other businesses that they started up, like other tech companies tend to do. And those are losing money right now, uh, but growing. Um, and if you just download their most recent set of financial statements and you uh, are provided with the numbers for the loss-making businesses and you back those out, and they're not that significant, um, you can see that the stock trades at five times earnings, which is extraordinary for such a large company. Now, there, there are good, very good reasons for that. Um, not that the company is shrinking dramatically, but it has a lot of competition and it's not really growing that quickly. Uh, there are parts of the business that are growing. It has a big international e-commerce business that's growing. Uh, you also get a, some other things for free. You get uh, one of the largest cloud companies uh, in China that you're not uh, paying for. Um, so, you know, when you when you... When you're small, you have a small pool of capital that you're investing, and, and we had many of these when, when we were running small amounts of money. We could go to South Korea or we could go to places in Italy and we could find these little companies that were uh, terribly mispriced. Uh, and you know we would invest in them, and, and if we got everything right, it would work out really well. But as you get larger and larger and larger because the markets are so, quote, unquote, efficient, it's extremely difficult to find, you know, what is observably an extremely good business uh, uh, that generates a lot of cash, that has uh, no financial risk, uh, that has very successful leadership, uh, that with a proven track record of of creating value, and they're buying back stock, meaningful amounts of stock at five times earnings and they know what they're doing and the insiders are putting money in. And, you know, you try to click all those items. You know, you want a, a, a good business with a strong balance sheet and a management team with a track record of creating value and you want to buy it in a seriously undervalued price. And situ- That's and a, a needle in a haystack. And a company that's situated in communist China. Well, you know, everything comes with, I read, I read with this a risk. Right, I read this right here in, in the Artist and International Value Fund report. Investopedia defines a centrally planned economy and it didn't sound good as I read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to report to your shareholders, you know, <laughs> you what exactly the risks yeah, are. Right. <laughs> A friend of our publication says you can have um, good news or good prices, but not both. And uh, China certainly seems to not have a lot of good news. Uh, Mm. Their economic model of uh, fixed asset investment fueled by a lot of debt seems to be crashing and people are worried about problems. Uh, Do you tend to run towards countries that have headline issues like that to try to find babies that are thrown out with bathwater? You know, we tend to run towards all sorts of problems, uh, whether they be country-based or company-based. You know, it is, you know, as Jim mentioned earlier, um, finding a security that is mispriced in a market that has so much money and so many institutional investors chasing after it is is not easy. Um, uh, but but the reality is, is is human psychology is human psychology, and people tend to like good news and dislike bad news. And uh, I'm wired to be much more interested in bad news than good news. And I've spent, you know, the better part of the last 22 years trying to find people who feel similarly about bad news. And, and uh, you know... Um, bad news is, is a living, yeah. Bad news, bad news in the stock market is uh, extraordinary. It's a, an extraordinary gift to it's the a, It's a precious gift. Investor. It is all too scarce, if you ask me. <laughs> well, at least in the 50 states. <laughs> I love this <laughs> quote that you quoted from uh, Phil Carre, this uh, great gentleman of yesteryear who wrote a book called The Art of Speculation. And the quote says, quote, uh, typically a uh, major uh, market movement runs so far 
uh, that the amateur in speculation forgets that an opposite trend has ever been known. More than a slight rise in money rates is necessary to kill a real bull market, close quote. And uh, God, you saw that in the bond market, certainly, right? I mean, um, 40 years of persistently falling interest rates, and they finally got to zero. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and the amateur investor, I think we can define a little bit differently today because there's been new entrants into this industry over the last decade where they, you know, we've been operating with extremely low interest rates, not only on a, you know, a nominal uh, level, but on a real level, they've been negative over that time period. And it's created extraordinary behavior on the part of most investors, uh, much of which, to, to my surprise, and uh, maybe not to your surprise, but to my surprise, we haven't seen uh, much in terms of repercussion since, you know, rates have gone up and, and they've gone up a lot. Don't get me started. <laughs> How many times have you seen a market in 2021 go from a full bubble level to a full correction to just being fully priced to, again, extraordinarily overvalued? I mean, it, it always seems like corrections always overshoot on either end, but this one didn't. Um, you know, the excitement around AI, if I can categorize this as an AI you market, know, Yeah, I is wouldn't uh, linger too long on that topic in this room, David. So <laughs> we don't really like to go. <laughs> um, so... Uh, well, I, again, uh, you know, I think that uh, human psychology is what we're dealing with here uh, in the stock market, and that is what creates the yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, whatever turns out to be false in the current reality uh, will potentially uh, result in some level of opportunities. One of our earliest investments was in a company called Amdocs. And I don't know if you've ever come across this company, but it's an Israeli company. It was one of these that was listed in the United States that my compliance group told me was an American company. And they uh, were um, a casualty of you know the tech bubble when it had burst. And effectively what they did is they ran billing software for telecommunications companies. And, you know, one of the things that a telecommunication company is not going to do is stop sending out its bills. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was a net cash business, and it was trading at six times earnings, not so different than uh, where Alibaba is trading today. Um, and, uh, you know, its growth, you know, the AT&T was a very large customer. It had to somewhat concentrate a customer base. And business went backwards for a little little while and then uh you know as they it was a very well positioned company and as they started to take on new customers and it started to grow it went from you know six times earnings up to 20 times earnings and 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 that's that's what we love we love to find a good business because a good business has an opportunity to go from a very low multiple to one that's more reflective of a better than average business multiple. And that's, that's the Samra juice, so to speak. You know, that's what we recognized very early on. Not that we're looking to buy a good business at a fair price, right? There's a lot of value investors today that are running around talking about that and doing that. No, we want to find a very good business at a significantly undervalued price. Uh, and that's way harder to do than finding a good business. Well, at what a do fair you do price. when you don't find it? How much? What's the most cash you have ever had in your portfolio? <laughs> so this is also, you know, part of human psychology. Uh, you know, we went through a big run and uh, very good investment performance post the financial crisis, and I went back to my customers who had signed on to a limit for cash at ten percent when we started way back in two thousand two, and I got them to agree to increase that limit to 15. And so we can go to 15 and hold cash at that level uh, uh, when when the environment why, is like Why this. a limit at all? There are business reality. You know, I was an analyst when we started. I, you know, I put all my own money in the fund. and But, I, you know, I work for somebody and uh, somebody wanted to have a business and had parameters and we got in a room and we arm wrestled around those parameters of what I would like to do as an investor and what they would like to have as a business. And, you know, that's, that's where we came out as to what was acceptable. And, you know, we, we work on these terms over time. 
Um, but today we live with a 15% limit. Well, shouldn't there be a, a codicil that if, if treasury bill rates are in excess of 4.9%, <laughs> cash is could be a minimum, maximum of 95%. Or, <laughs> so, to, um, and David, tell us the parable of the wall you built on sand on a rising slope. <laughs> well, um, I, I sometimes... Uh, I tend to do things on a whim, and, and, and luckily I'm married like to Like investing, woman. right? Uh, not in oh, investing, no, sorry, just uh, wrong thing. personal <laughs> things, personal okay. things. Um, and, uh, well, I have a house in San Francisco, and it's built on sand. And I wanted to, and, and it's on a hill, uh, and I wanted to take what was a, a very ugly-looking backyard when I bought the house, uh, and several years later try to turn it into a nice patio. And I learned that uh, building on sand is complicated because it's unstable, uh, but building on sand on a hill is even more unstable. And so with uh, a lot of complexity and a lot of cost, we ended up with 14 steel beams, several of which were 40 feet long, in order to execute on this quite expensive patio. Um, which is very nice. It has a view of the Golden Gate Bridge. and uh, I'm sure it's worth every million dollars. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, uh, well, I, I wrote about a little bit about this in my shareholder letter because, you know, uh, if you uh, then, if I tried to sell my home and, I've, you know, I've tried to get a, a value on it on several occasions because San Francisco tra- t- tends to get crazy, um, and you show the house square footage to a realtor, you know, they'll, they'll give you a number based on the amount of square footage that you have. And I, I say, no, 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 you don't understand. But all these other houses, they don't have steel beams. Mine has steel beams and a beautiful patio. And they just, you know, they, they look at you with a blank stare. And, 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 and what I was, the point that I was trying to make and I was never able to deliver this message to my shareholders because I had COVID that year, was, you know, in this time period where, where people use the word deglobalizing, but I think just we're sort of moving things around because of uh, practical realities. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that we don't see. We don't see semiconductors, really. You know, we have a lot of electronic products, but we don't, we don't see them. We don't see PPI until... We need PPI, uh, and we don't look at where a lot of the products that we use are manufactured. And if we have this goal and objective, you know, to to move all of this manufacturing, uh, you know, out of its most efficient uh, geography to I don't know where Mexico or somewhere in Latin America or India or Indonesia or Vietnam, you know, there are costs associated with that and. Uh, who's going to pay for those costs? Who's going to want to pay for those costs? And that will lead to inflation. And interestingly, you know, it was uh, that was several years ago when I I, I wrote that little missive. Uh, we're seeing some of that now. We're seeing some of the incremental costs associated with the changes uh, that are being made across the globe. And uh, you know, I haven't done the math to see exactly you know, what the impact might be to inflation, perhaps uh, here at Grants, you've had a number cruncher who's looked at this. Um, but the reality is, you know, sometimes when you're moving around things that people can't see, uh, it's very, very hard to get to get paid for that. And the cost will show up in, you know, political uncertainty or higher interest rates, which which end up costing people money so uh, in so many 40, different ways. 40 foot steel beams aren't free. They, they are not free, and nor is the giant crane that is required to deliver those uh, in an urban environment. Well, David, thank you for being with us. This is uh, David Sommer, as you've been hearing, ladies and gentlemen, the winner of Grant's Jeopardy <laughs> and the astute manager of the Artisan International Value. But, you know, I feel a little bit, David, as if we buried the lead in disappointing fashion by having it kind of uh, seep out that you're closed to new investment. So... Um, so could you just open for the listeners of this podcast? Uh, if they would send an email on the amount they would like <laughs> to invest, and if it's small enough, perhaps.
Now, let, let us qualify this to all attendees at the 2024 Grants Conference, right? <laughs> if they could do it, that would be good, right? <laughs> all right. Thank well, you very much. Thanks for being with us. It's okay. been my pleasure. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Jim Grant on behalf of uh, Current Yield, Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air. Thank you.